Yes, let's start with, oh, actually, first let's uh, confirm. Yeah, are we uh, switching? We are, I, I got it. Brilliant, awesome. All right, so let's uh, start out, do some uh, kind of summary. Let me, let me see where my thing is here. Yeah, so I did, while you do that, hello everyone, welcome to the, this is the middle of the shift four recap. So of DEF CON capture the flag, Jan's going to be talking about it and recapping where we are right now. And so we just wanna share with you uh, the current state of the game. The game is currently running live right now. So please uh, bear with us if we have to quickly run and put out fires and then come back. Uh, you know, we're happy to talk, but we gotta, our first and foremost responsibility is making sure that this game runs smooth. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's uh, we're trying to ba uh, balance a lot of uh, things in the air right now, juggle a lot of balls. Um, so Adam mentioned we're halfway through tick four. This is uh, getting close to the end of the game. There's four hours left in the entire shift four. Shift four. Shift. Right. There's uh, four hours left in the entire CTF competition, uh, and the teams are super close. So these are the current scores. Let me show you uh, something crazy. AOE right now is ticking upwards about in 15 ticks, if everything continues as is, AOE will overtake PPP for first place. But the scoreboard is going dark, so they'll never know if they make it or if PPP adapts to uh, defend against their exploits. So can you explain what you mean by going dark? Like people won't be able to see this scoreboard? Absolutely, um, yeah. Um, so every year, um, on, traditionally on the last day, on Sunday of the CTF, we have four hours of gameplay and those four hours are completely uh, dark. So the scoreboard is not updated in real time, uh, but the results are only announced at the closing ceremonies. Likewise here, the last four hours are completely dark, um, but we'll see uh, what happens uh, when when it happens. Yeah, you got to tune into that closing ceremony to find exactly. the thrilling conclusion of DEF CON CTF 28. All right, so this is uh, kind of a live, or uh, not a live, uh, a more uh, animation-y uh, sort of overview. I'm gonna refresh it so we can all watch it and like ooh and ah. So this, from the beginning, uh, we started shift one at what's happening? 4 a.m. Oh, on Friday, happen, right? And on, on Friday at 4 a.m. And very quickly, within about an hour, AOE started uh, hacking a service that we created that where players, uh, it was a blackjack service uh, written in Game Life. We talked about it, or we will talk about it this uh, recap. Um, and then uh, services started getting released that um, teams were able to uh, start scoring on heavily and PPP overtook AOE to get first place. The team called Samurai with that uh, Unicode character uh, name is uh, in third. And for a while there was this cat and mouse game between PPP and AOE um, basically into uh, day two. This game um, is very much a story of those two teams fighting against each other so far. But not always. So you just saw um, sometime yesterday, um, more Bush Moth Whackers, a team from uh, a, of a lot of really awesome hackers from Russia uh, overtook second place. Um, but then AOE, uh, a bunch of awesome hackers from China, took that back and gained very steadily on PPP. And for a while, um, and PPP is a bunch of very good hackers from the US, for a while, they uh, were neck and neck. Like you can see, it's it's a war of attrition here. Um, as they solved and patched and exploited and patched and AOE. And for, and for a little bit of a context, Jan, that number in the lower right hand corner, the tick number is each tick lasts about six minutes. Exactly. So we're yeah, seeing a really sped up version of this of the teams moving. Absolutely, and so you can see um, AOE uh, won out when went uh, up into first place for a long time, PPP clawed their way back um, as there started being movement lower on the scoreboard as well. So T Delivers and HitCon here are uh, fighting as well. Um, and so this was uh, the state of the game as of the beginning of this shift. And now we're gonna look at what's happening this shift. We see PPP building out a lead, uh, very uh, slow but steady, um, while 
teams lower down, third and fourth place start catching up. Um, and that's basically where we are right now. So uh, PPP in first, AUE in second, then uh, HitCon, which is a team of HitCon and Balson, which is a, a collaboration of two very awesome teams from um, Taiwan. Uh, T Delivers, awesome hackers from China, more Bush Smoke Whackers, awesome hackers uh, from Russia um, in the, the top um, five places right now. But this can change very quickly. If a team, DevCon CTF consists of a bunch of different services, uh, intentionally and sometimes even unintentionally vulnerable programs that the teams have to protect uh, and attack um, and find optimal and optimal, more and more optimal solutions for. Um, when a team finds a unique solution that no one has defended against, a unique exploit that they can throw at everyone, it uh, can lead to radical massive changes throughout the game. Um, so that that is a, uh, this scoreboard could could change very, very suddenly. And some, some of these, uh, you know, ticks, you probably saw it. There was one very specific time where Samurai found a solution for them and they just went and started um, going up and up. Um, cool. So, um, Let's see, what else should we give as an overview? Um, let me give a quick overview of where we are in terms of what challenges we have um, uh, run so far, and then we'll, we'll dive into uh, the individual challenge overviews uh, as part of this recap. So these are all of the services of our um, CTF. Um, all of the services have now been uh, launched. We've um, uh, retired one, two, three, four, five of them so far because uh, they've been solved a ton and, and, and uh, really closed out by the teams. And then there are still uh, five running right now. Um, Adam, there's a lot of Slack notifications. Everything uh, going okay? Yep. I, okay. Everything's good. Keep going. I'm silencing. I quit Slack and then I'm silencing my uh, phone. Cool. Okay. Um, so we have uh, 10 challenges, uh, services, five of them still active. We're going to go through and talk about a lot of the inactive ones uh, because we can talk about them uh, fully without really uh, keeping anything back. And then we'll uh, discuss um, at a very high level some of the still active ones. Before we dive into that, I'll show you one uh, website. It is called archive.ooo. So this is archive.oo. This is where we release after we retire challenges. Uh, not all of them. It depends on if they're very easy to release because we don't have a lot of bandwidth during the competition to debug issues, uh, where we release a lot of the challenges. So the challenges that we have so far retired, two of them, two of those five, are already here on archive.oo. So you can click in, um, click in and attempt them from home. You can download the, the files. You can host them either on your own machine, and we provide, excuse me, Docker containers, or um, you log in and we'll spin up a machine for you to attack. Um, Which is a perfect transition into, why don't, what can we transition into uh, the RHG service and why it's not on here? Absolutely. One very complicated uh, service that we had yesterday was called the Role Hacking Game. Um, or we had it the day before yesterday, but it was, we launched it on, on our uh, second shift, which was uh, Friday night, Las Vegas time. And it stayed up uh, and survived until Saturday morning, roughly Las Vegas time when the teams finally uh, hacked it into oblivion. I'm gonna pass the torch here over to uh, Ray Yammer, who uh, can talk about the, uh, challenge in more detail. And we'll say as we're switching over that Yannick 
Yeah, Rammer is now an expert in making grids in CSS <laughs> yeah. and HTML, as you can see here. So if you have any questions about anything CSS, HTML related, direct it to the excellent Rammer. Exactly. And if you want to get just a glimpse of the pain for developing this challenge, try to zoom in or zoom out. I don't remember. I think Chrome is going to render this with some non-pixel perfect and a width. And so you're going to see some cells actually flipping over and then when players are supposed to be moving vertically, they're going to move diagonally. Yeah, if this, happens, That's amazing. if this happens two hours before the game, then you start to freak out and regret all your adult decisions. So why this challenge? Uh, the idea was to, you know, it's all online. So we, we really try to push the boundary on having challenges where spectators can actually spectate something and not just a bunch of nerds, uh, you know, pressing keys on, on their laptops. And... Uh, uh, the, 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 the first idea that comes to mind when seeing, you know, players fighting with each other is RPG games. So RAJ is a, is a, you know, stands for role hacker game or for who enjoyed it, Rayamer hackers game. And uh, the idea was to have some kind of RPG kind of game themed on hackers. So each team was controlling a player. And in, in this grid, basically, there is a live website. Uh, it is public. Uh, I don't know if people can read it, but uh, there is, I guess, a link somewhere. Uh, basically, if you if you go with your mouse on one of these items in the grid, you're gonna see, oh, that's a player, or oh, this is an item. So each player is controlled by one of the 16 teams uh, that were invited to the finals. And uh, as in a, any RPG game, basically you can control this player and you can go around buy items or from other people or you know get items and try to you know attack other people and so forth. So the hacking component here was okay, the team you can basically get a USB key or a phishing kit and then launch attacks to the other, to the other teams. Uh, it was very painful to, to design this uh, in terms of design. Uh, first of all, we need a central service, a central server, which complicates a lot of things in terms of testing because, you know, if you have 16 players trying to hit the same guy, then, you know, you have uh, performance issues or debugging issues. You know, it's a distributed system. So it's, uh, it's really, really bad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, there was none, absolutely zero security issue. Um, uh, so one other thing was, okay, great idea. Let's have this game, but where do you put the flags? So the idea here is that the flags are not on the services that teams usually hack, but they are in the game itself. So each team was, was given like a, you know, some kind of program to play with that I'm going to go to this point. Uh, that that's the part that actually contains vulnerabilities, but there were no flags there. The flags were leaving as part of the game. So the idea is that each year round, so every six minutes, the state of the game resets and each player is born with an item and this item is the flag. So each of the 16 guys uh, actually had, uh, you know, player one was born with flag number one, player two was born with flag number two and so forth. So the idea is that if you have an object, you can inspect it. And if you can inspect the flag, you can actually read the flag that you can submit to us, the organizers. But if you don't own an item, then you cannot do this. So the idea was to have some kind of a game in the game where you need to hack people in the game to somehow steal their flag in the game as an object and somehow read it. Uh, I thought it was a cool idea because, you know, if you start stealing a bunch of flags and then somebody else kills you, then all your items are dropped on the floor. And so this other guy can actually pick everything up and steal all your flags as it would actually happen in an RPG game. So it was a lot of, uh, you know, uh, depth in this game where basically there were many actions. Uh, you could buy things, you can force a buy from another player. Uh, so you could basically buy their flag, or again, there were a bunch of objects through which you can run tax and somehow this player, the victim, would, if he didn't have enough defenses, he would be locked out, his item would be on the floor, you can pick it up, the flag, and so forth. Uh, the second component was there must be some security aspect uh, in terms of, you know, kind of bugs. So the idea is that each team was given uh, like a, a client. Uh, this client, somehow, if you connect to this client, there will be an authentication token that you can use to authenticate to the Asha server and control your own player. The idea was that this client uh, was the only way players could access the game server, and this client would not tell you which are the comments. So there was a kind of discovery phase at the beginning where you would see dumb things happening in the game because people didn't really figure out uh, what to do. So I've seen people like trying to fudge the comments and you've seen people dropping the flag on the floor. They would be very stupid. Why they did it? Because it, they were not, they were trying to still discover what kind of actions the game was implementing. The other thing was that these clients had bugs. The idea was that as a player, I can find bugs in the system and jump on the machine of somebody else and authenticate myself as another player. 
And if you authenticate yourself as another player, you can push these players to do stupid things in the game and steal the flag. So there were a couple of uh, interesting things we've seen uh, that I think were very cool. The first one is that they started, there was a player, I think it was a EOE, EOE that uh, started basically hijacking all the players in the game and start inspecting the flag. So basically by just authenticating as them, they could read their own flags and uh, the, the flags of the target player and, and somehow leak it. But then they started to do something interesting. We've seen AOE, they basically that add still the flags, but every other teams were without a flag. So every team was actually dropping their own flags. What was happening is that this AOE team was first reading the flag from the other players and they were convincing or, you know, pushing other players to drop them. So if another player had the same attack, he could not easily read uh, this flag. The cool part is that if you knew the moves, you can actually go around in the grid and pick up the flag because now it's on the floor and read it. But at the beginning, people really didn't figure out how to do this. And so there were a lot of flags on the floor and nobody there to pick except uh, two, three teams. The last thing we've seen uh, was that at a certain point, you know, there were bugs that would let other people control your player and uh, teams actually patched it. And it was PPP that actually was one of the first that patched uh, all the bugs. There were four bugs, uh, four intended bugs there. And so this AOE basically started attacking everybody, but PPP was still able to keep the flag. And at that point, we've seen AOE actually figuring out the game, picking up some objects and attacking PPP in the game itself and stealing the flag in that way. And so, of course, you could defend there, but you need to play the game. You need to, you know, there was software updates, so, you know, a jammer to stop Wi-Fi attacks and things like this. Uh, PvP didn't figure it out uh, that well. And so the cool part was that after it was a security, you know, memory corruption kind of thing, then there was still a game to explore and, uh, and hack people uh, there. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to, I think I'm going to write a blog post on, there were many, many des design issues uh, that I what think What about I, the source code? I saw the source code will be public. Um, but yeah, the, the interesting part for me was more the design. It was quite tricky, but somehow I think it, we, we found a, a good, a good, uh, trade-off. But yeah. And so the very, you know, the reason why this isn't in the archive, right. Is because it needs this central server and you have 16 teams. It's like very much designed for a challenge specifically for DEF CON CTL. Yeah. Right? The, the GitHub repository is going to have all the components to somehow replicate this, but I think it's interesting to see how it is designed, not really all how to solve it. Uh, there is a binary with some bugs. Uh, the, the, the source code is commented with the four bugs I'm aware of. Uh, they are not very complicated. The idea was to push people to patch them fast and so that they need to move uh, to play the game. And at least for PP, we actually have seen it where they were defeated in the game, uh, in the game component. Uh, in some, it was a very bad idea. I mean, uh, it was a crazy amount of work. The most painful part was the web UI stuff. If you check my JavaScript, it, I think it's kind of clear I'm not a web guy. But yeah, I don't envy these web uh, people and somehow I respect them. They keep their mind sane. And you know, you probably know how to reach me. Right, ping me uh, if you have questions, but I'm gonna release a blog post in a couple of days if I'm still around. Awesome. Sweet. Cool. All right, so that's um, RHG. Let's see what... Um... In the similar gaming vein, we can take it over to... Uh, let let me give uh, just a summary of what teams did what um oh, again cool. whom. so you can see um we we take uh consider a, a service to be uh, done when a, any one team hacks it 600 times um and so that's stealing 600 unique flags across all the other teams and in this case uh, we call this last blood as opposed to first blood who, who the first team to um pwn the service um, Last Blood was made by AOE and um, was uh, shut down the service. At the time, the runner-up, Psychor, had 200 less flags on this service. So AOE was, was quite effective uh, here. In terms of defense, you can also see the uh, total amount of flags lost throughout the entire lifespan of the role hacking game. Um, AOE lost nine uh, flags by being hacked um, on this game. So that's a uh, pretty, pretty impressive uh, achievement there. Um, Yannick mentioned that that we try to philosophically uh, capture some, um, you know, something that that can be visualizable, visual, 
something that lends itself well to visualization. We also uh, had a bit of this philosophy of since everyone is remote, we created uh, you know services that people could directly uh, compete with each other. RHG was one such uh, service. Uh, we talked about another such yesterday, and we'll talk about uh, more later today. For now, we're going to switch over to another uh, service in the vein of, um, oh, Basarat, do you have time restrictions or your, you can talk about yours right now? We can't hear you. While he uh, sorts out his uh, um, chat issues, oh, it's probably push to speak. Yeah, I bet it's your push to speak settings. Anyways, um, while uh, Balzarat sorts out that, uh, I'll introduce this next challenge. Um, it is a challenge that uh, captured the core of a lot of modern program analysis in the search for vulnerabilities. Um, where is it? Nope. That's a preview for what's to come. Where did it go? Sound. Now we can hear you. Awesome. All right, go for right. it. Yeah, sorry for the background. You can probably hear my kids crying in the background. Um, here in Europe is now bedtime for kids, so it's a bit of a uh, mess hey. around here. Davide, um, Davide, if I, can, if I can interrupt you for one second, we have a breaking game update. Real time, blood. Last Blood service loot machine has been uh, PPP stole over 600 flags for the service and it is now inactive and down for the rest of the game. All right. They hit that jackpot. Last blood on salute machine. Awesome. Oh, everyone. Very cool. All right, go ahead. Sorry. Back to you. Right, yeah. so, so I was going to talk about a bit uh, about my challenge. So did you guys already talk about King of the Hills? What's the concept? In the previous recaps. Do you want to introduce it? We, we you, should, you should reintroduce it. All right. So so my challenge was a king of the year challenge. Uh, so the mechanics are a bit different from uh, what you know normal challenger challenges are. Uh, so traditional challenges are attack defense, which means that you need to break into uh, the other team service and steal the flag. And typically you score points by submitting this flag. So the more flags you steal, uh, the more points you score, at least for attacks, right? And then you need to defend your service and uh, therefore scoring defense points when your service is not attacked. So for King of the Yield, the mechanic is a bit different. So the idea here is that instead we want to reward better solution. So you get more points by submitting a better solution, not necessarily by stealing flags. So there are no flags at all to steal. Okay, so some King of the Hills uh, uh, implement this by uh, keeping state. So the best solution is the best solution overall in the game. Uh, sometimes instead is a best solution that works for that particular tick. So maybe it's a game in which they need to play once against the other and the best solution in that particular tick will get rewarded by getting more points. So that's the mechanic. So it's really to try to push the teams to develop more and more complex solution and, um, you know, each other uh, with the best solution. It's also quite nice because while traditional attack defense take, uh, challenges, you often don't see any score for a quite long amount of time because you want to have difficult vulnerabilities. And so the game is sort of like, you know, in a state in which you don't see anything for very, very, very long time, maybe six, seven hours before they start scoring. With a King of the Year, you can design the game in a way that it's very easy to score at the beginning. So you can start scoring in five minutes. But then it takes a lot of time to build up and, you know, make better and better solutions. So you can keep, you know, refining your, your solution also after 10 hours or more. All right. So enough about King of the Hill. So my challenge was a King of the Hill challenge. It was named Pinball. And uh, so the original idea was to develop a challenge around the concept of uh, code coverage. So I wanted to basically have team competing, teams competing in getting the, bad, the best code coverage over a certain binary. Okay. So, however, it's a bit dry to have simple code coverage, and I didn't want to have just complicated formulas that you need, you know, uh, to throw to a constraint solver to solve. So, I team basically the challenge around the concept of pinball, a pinball machine. Okay. And, David, uh, could you uh, very briefly maybe introduce 
the concept of code coverage and, and constraint solvers and, control control flow and all that. Yeah. Well, very simply, so the idea is that uh, we have a binary and the binary have a certain control flow. So you have like uh, many basic blocks, of course, that contains the code that are connected together. And uh, the idea was that you want to reward teams that are able to explore more of this binary. So to reach different basic blocks, to reach more and more basic blocks in a certain way. Of course, and that's the general idea. Then when you translate that into a game, you don't simply want them to reach all basic blocks because you have a lot of paths that basically lead to, sort of to you know, very boring checks on certain input uh, variables. And uh, so the idea was to do something similar. So the forces team to uh, find a way to craft an input to reach different basic blocks, but just to focus on those basic blocks that are more difficult to reach, those are more interesting. That's why the team was this pinball idea in which you have uh, ramps and you have jackpots and you have uh, little targets to eat and different parts of the program are associated to different pieces, parts of a pinball machine. Okay? And um, in this game, basically the idea is that teams have to submit uh, one ball, which was a binary blob of one kilobyte. And this, uh, it's uh, basically a format, a special format that has its own magic uh, value at the beginning. Ball then he has a sort of section headers with different uh, little uh, structures that define which uh, shot you want to do. Uh, you want to hit with the left flipper, with the right flipper. You want to, I don't know, kick the table to try to save the ball and things like this. Uh, so think about, I don't know, a P file or an L file, sort of, you know, along those way. Um, but it's a custom format for uh, this game. And um, and then the game had uh, a number of targets that you need to eat. And uh, it was very abstract, of course. So the idea is that uh, you shoot the ball and then uh, there is an internal random number generator. So it will basically decide where the ball goes. And depending if it goes on the right flipper, on the right flipper, you need to, of course, hit it with the right uh, shot and decide where you want to, hit, uh, to send the ball. And then the different targets have different sort of mini puzzle. I don't know, you want to the ball on the ramp, you need to provide a certain input to satisfy a certain weird set of constraints. That's the idea of the game. And um, and again, uh, the idea was that you can score very quickly at the beginning. You just throw the ball in and you can get a couple of points. But then you immediately find out that, for example, that the random number generator is always uh, seeded with the same value. And it's always very bad for you because every time you just throw the ball in the pinball, it just comes down exactly straight in the drain. So you can't really do much. And uh, so the first thing you need to figure out, that's the first sort of puzzle is, how do I control this so then I can make different shots and I can actually do something interesting. And uh, so there are all these sort of internal puzzles. So for example, to do that, you need to figure out that there is a little path that if you try to shoot the ball inside the pinball with uh, strength zero, then it will fail the shot. And then it will let you kick the table several times. And every time you kick the table, it sort of consumes some number in the number gener uh, num random number generator. So you can basically bring it to a state that is the one that you want, for example, for the kind of uh, a target that you want to hit. That's the idea. Um, so do you model this off of the pinball in Windows uh, XP? The what? Never mind. It's a bad joke. Oh, oh the, the, on a the real game. pinball. Oh. Maybe, maybe people have never played a real pinball machine, you know? This is... Uh, well, I feel sorry if you didn't. I mean, that's if the only thing where you ever play is the one of Microsoft Windows. That's that's very sad. But anyway, it's so, the only skiing I've ever done is in ski jump. Uh, so yeah, so that was the game. You had five jackpots to eat, and if you were able to eat these five jackpots, you will get a mega jackpot. But another thing, since this is a security game, is not just finding the right input to reach the different parts of the game, but there were also vulnerabilities. And the game rewards you for vulnerabilities because every time you crash the game, it gives you an extra ball. So you can play another ball and accumulate points. There were two in intended vulnerabilities in the game, and I don't know if there were unintended vulnerabilities that people could actually uh, take advantage of, but I, I, I still need to check all the solution at the end of the game, but I, I don't know about that. Uh, so for a total of three balls, and with three balls, it was possible to hit all the jackpots, basically, and, uh, and finish the game. I want to show you also that uh, I have a visualization for that. Can I share the screen? I've been streaming the visualization the whole time, but you can also uh, share the screen. Oh, you, 
Sorry, I didn't see that. Yeah. Okay. I love this interface, actually. Yeah, we've been uh, getting uh, mildly yeah. sick watching this. All right. Um, so you get a bit sick uh, if uh, they do some certain weird moves. Um, so yeah, indeed. So there's this visualization in JavaScript that basically shows uh, the control flow of the entire... Yeah, this is the part in which you get sick. Uh, that's the entire control flow of the application. And there are these little uh, uh, basic blocks that are in uh, bright yellow. These are sort of the ones that are associated to special jackpot or special moves. And uh, here you see, you know, basically... A is T delivers actually one of the ball, ball one of T delivers. Uh, shows that you know they went around and they were able to eat different jackpots uh, inside the code. Uh, it turned out that it was pretty difficult to generate this uh, uh, the file for the visualization because the teams got very, very good and so their traces got longer and longer. Uh, so at a certain point, I had to give up because a single ball sometimes it was playing for almost 20 minutes and that was not really unless your goal is to. You know, is probably not the best uh, thing to watch for 20 minutes. So what was kind of the factor of slowdown for visualizing over their normal execution? How fast would these 20 minutes to visualize balls take uh, when they just the execute one, The one you're watching now is, I think it's like, uh, I think it makes six basic blocks per second or something like this. Um, so some traces that contain several thousand basic blocks. Uh, so you cannot speed it up too much because then you don't see anything. It will just go too fast. And you cannot just play it too, you know, too slow. Otherwise, it will take forever. Um, because, of course, when I tested, I tested on my bolt that were optimized to hit all the jackpots. And then you find out that teams, of course, they just optimize to get better scores, which sometimes just means, for example, make a lot of invalid shots because uh, they accumulate bonuses, for example. And, uh, yeah, they don't do anything useful, but at the end, you, there was a little bonus that you get every time you hit the ball. So if you just make a lot of, you know, if you hit the ball a lot of time without doing anything in particular, which means uh, sometimes hundreds of time, uh, it's not very clever, but you will still get a lot of points. So they will obviously try to maximize the number of things they can fit in this one kilobyte of data. And, uh, yeah, and sometimes the visualization at that point, it gets... So in this case, for example, that's what they were doing. They were, I think, kicking the table here to try to, you know, uh, discuss number from the random number generator that were not favorable to their strategy. So are there any uh, strategies that you had thought of that you didn't see the teams use? Or I I need, yeah, I mean, it's, I need to now check exactly what they did at the end. I crashed at the end, so I had to sleep. And uh, as I say, some of these traces are very long, so I need to really sort of debug it. The system is all automated, so now I need to manually look at exactly what they did. Um, yeah, in terms of strategy, of course, you know, my uh, original idea of the way the game would have evolved actually didn't turn out to be correct at all. Uh, I was thinking that some of these puzzles were very easy to, uh, to solve, and some of them are actually pretty hard. Eventually, uh, teams got some hard ones, but they missed some of the easy ones. Um, it depends. I I think it took uh, way longer than I expected to figure out this thing of uh, kicking the table uh, with the fake uh, first shot. Um, I think uh, they, yeah, so some of them they didn't get it. It's always good to run this king of the hills because it's very hard to know what you can expect. They always come up with very very strange solution. That uh, yeah, it's amazing then to look at the at their strategy. For sure, they score way more points without getting all the jackpot that I thought it was possible. I didn't think it was possible to score 200k points without finishing the game. Uh, apparently, they did it. I still need to investigate out, but yeah. That is awesome. Yeah, just uh, kind of as a bit of more context for for that specific statement, we expected Pinbull um, to last one day, uh, one shift in our game, which is uh, eight hours. So the CTF split into four shifts of eight hours, 32 hours total, uh, with a rest period in between, but the players don't really use the rest period to rest. They use it to um, write more exploits and prepare for the next shift. We expected Thimble to uh, go for one shift, but it went for two shifts. Uh, because it took uh, a little while longer than expected for teams to ramp up. And they also kept going much farther than we expected in terms of points, as Davide mentioned. If you, if you look at the graph here, it's not very complex in the sense that the entire application is about 600 line of C code. 
then get basically all in line in a single gigantic control flow. Uh, but there are, there are no tricks to actually make it harder to reverse. So you can easily decompile it. And uh, of course there are data structures, you know, it takes you know, a bit to maybe to read it, but really I think most of the time goes into try to find a solution for these uh, puzzles. Like, I don't know, some of the bugs were difficult to find. Some of the bugs were obvious to find, but you think, okay, that's not possible. For example, one of the bugs is that it's an array with three elements. And every time you hit the bumpers, he basically saves in this uh, array, you know, your, your position. And uh, if you hit it three times, there are only two slots. Basically, there's a clear overflow. I think teams probably figured that out in like uh, 10 minutes. Uh, but the weird thing is that to make one of the shots, you need 500 bytes of data. And uh, the entire file is one kilobyte. So obviously it looks like, yeah, if I can make three, I can easily crash the system, but I can only fit two. And so then most of the time it goes into try to find a way to you know, play tricks with the file format so you can squeeze three basically of this shot inside, inside, the, same, uh, inside the same file. Yeah, and on kind of that note in terms of um, this sort of file format trickery, it's a bit of a genre of, of hacker tricks. Um, there's a very interesting write-up out there on the internet where someone makes an L file, a Linux program that returns 42, I think, and they make it in 40 something bytes. Uh, that was an inspiration. Yeah, that was a, one of the inspiration for the channel, right? So the idea that you can overlap different data structures and you can try to reuse uh, certain bytes from one uh, piece of your input to actually, you know, do something else in another piece of the input. So that's really one of the, the core concepts, I think. Uh, Maximize your score. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. So that's uh, the uh, pinball challenge. Um, that's one king of the hill we've discussed today. Um, unless are you are you done? Yeah. 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 Brilliant. Um, there's also another uh, king of the hill um, that we retired last shift, uh, which is called Casino Life. Um, we figured the teams would uh, miss Las Vegas. And so we uh, brought Las Vegas to them. Uh, Eric, do you wanna talk about that? Sure, thanks. Uh, just a second, let's see if I can get my screen shared, maybe. Ah, this looks familiar. looks like something I've been staring at for 16 hours in the last 36 hours. But I'm sure it's longer for you, Trickle. Uh, for sure. Uh, is there? Oh, never mind. Let's see. Screen. Uh, we're watching the casino life right now from uh, Zardis's screen. If you wanna. But I think Trickle has some extra. I was gonna try to. Yeah, I was trying to share my screen. It's all right. You know, complicated. Let's see. Is that? Can you guys see that? Yes, if Jan, you stop sharing. We see everything, just FYI. Yeah. Hopefully not. Hopefully not too much. So um, this has been a almost year-long project in some ways because uh, we had two challenges in Qualls that made it, uh, that where we used the Game of Life concept. So Game of Life, uh, was originally, I guess, theoretically designed or come up with uh, 40, 50 years ago. And since then, there have been tools around it that enable some of the, the rules that, uh, that describe it. Um, and Game of Life itself is uh, an experiment that explores artificial life and how cells would replicate given certain rules. And people have taken this, of course, to the extreme. And in a few few years ago, they developed a uh, computer simulation that's inside Game of Life. And this is using the raw rules. They also implemented one using the uh, this abstraction called the var life rules. Uh, this implementation, which was uh, used for DEFCON qualls, 
I just want to kind of show you so you can kind of see the breakdown and you'll see this design again in a minute when I start talking about the blackjack game. Uh, but this is kind of the, the high level view and we'll just kind of zoom in a little bit on one pixel, what looked like it was a pixel and then we keep going. And then literally this is, you're now looking at a single cell. And these cells, as this is going, interact in different ways. And so, for example, this larger cell, this, uh, I can't remember, 1800 by 1800, something like that size, they all interact in a way where it can stabilize or be stable or not stable, but it actually interacts with each of its neighbors on this kind of macro scale. And so the designers of this CPU came up with eight different states of this large group of cells that would uh, make it easier not only to interpret but and run, but to, uh, to visualize and work with. Um, let's see if I can find real quick. So this is the memory portion of the CPU. And if one of these was enabled, which it's not, let's speed it up a tiny bit. Uh, so you can see over here, well, I don't have the population enabled, but there are millions of cells on here that have to interact and play with now, if we kind of fast forward out of that and we look at the color version, you can see up here, actually, there are eight different states that are available in here. And when you zoom in, a single cell is just one of these. So one of these was replicated before by thousands of the cells yeah, cool. in the same game of life. Um, one of my favorite parts when I first started playing with this, I don't know how well it'll come across on the stream, but it's just watching these different pieces flow through these different logic gates and how everything works. It's just kind of pretty and elegant. You can watch, so this first opcode, so it works on opcodes similar to most processors. And uh, the different arguments are over here and they're gonna filter up into these different delay mechanisms and repurposing multiplexers and stuff that will uh, be filtered out so that eventually it'll pick one of these opcodes and run them. Now for the original design, it didn't really have a mechanism for input and output. And so for uh, Blackjack, we had to come up with a way, A, to, to simulate random number generation uh, for the cards, and then also to, uh, to receive information in and out. So taking a step back, Let's uh, look at an overview. So this is kind of a high level overview of the Frankenstein that was this challenge. Um, each player, so I'm sorry, each uh, team had a controller that was run by the, what should probably be named Bigali controller. And so there were 16 of these in the cases of the teams and so going down and each one of them would have had this communication channel where they would talk to the dealer the blue or green however you see the colors in here are the game of life portion plus there was this c plus plus wrapper that uh was borrowed to execute the the game of life and to add some wrappers around it because unfortunately despite i mean or looking at how big this is the execution is relatively slow. It takes about uh, 5,000 to 7,000 generations for a single instruction. So coming down here, down this path is a single instruction. And we spent some time trying to find a way to make it faster and just couldn't and ended up borrowing the code from the guys that created Golly and just tweak it to, to do what we needed for the, the Blackjack simulator. And then we just anyway. use the classic technique of throwing a bunch of cores at it, right? Uh, and then use the classic technique, yeah. So we ended up, each one of these uh, pictures here was either a process or a forked process. And then the dealer itself actually forked uh, for every message that came in, it would spawn up to 16 additional uh, forks to handle that one message. So when it 
went through the game alive portion, it was very, uh, it would it could only handle kind of one thing at a time. And, but it would leave everything in a, in a solid state for hopefully for the next messages. And then we broke out the shuffler into its own process too, because it was relatively slow. Originally we had had even the code, you wouldn't, well, you wouldn't think that it'd take too long to get random numbers and then um, assign them to cards. And the random number generation was pretty fast. That was done by this little guy over here that I created to um, this handles, this does an XOR shift uh, random number generation based off the seed. And the seed is given by the C++ program up here. Um, and it does an XOR shift on it. I can't remember the exact one, but to the right, eight, to the left, nine, and to the right, seven, something like that. And then uh, filters everything back in. And so when the request comes through from the opcode, from the RAND opcode down here, when it all flows through, it releases it and it saves it in this uh, intermediate, basically a register. Uh, these two registers, this is where it's going to go in memory, and this is the actual value that's going to go in memory. And uh, it would release it from there, and then we would have additional instructions that did the selection of the cards to make sure that we weren't, we had a true deck. And 52 cards was taking anywhere to, to find those, it's taking anywhere from 30 seconds to 60 seconds and like 20 million generations or steps through this guy. So that's kind of why the, the different pieces are, are broken up here that you can see. Now, moving on to, so that was the dealer and the shuffler looks very similar. We uh, reduced the amount of memory it was using because that speeds up the timing since you have to wait actually for an electron when yeah, it's those running. Ones and, ones and zeros are expensive. That's what people don't yeah. realize. We've been so yeah. uh, spoiled by silicone chips. For sure. I mean, now this is, you know, a little slower than uh, even what we had back when I was a kid, but it's moving. Yeah, it in moved. a physical world with its own rules. It really is. And it, you know, and it's just, it's slow, but it, uh, it works and it's very uh, sequential, not parallel. It's not like parallel AF, <laughs> very the opposite. Um, now you can see the random number generator over here is working a little bit. And so it's working as a total side process that generates these numbers. Each time one, one is used, it runs through this process and generates another one. And that was for speed, just to help speed it up. Um, now looking at the, uh, let's look at, so the, the reference team implementation, this is what the teams received. And this version that they were given, you can see, they're missing any kind of random number generator. They um, have this network in and out. So when they copy values to here, the C++ program picks it up and transports it to the dealer. And the same with messages that are coming back. And uh, these are accessed through new opcodes that weren't previously available. And then uh, that was the reference one. Now this implementation for the poor teams, uh, would wasn't very good at blackjack. It was uh, it would bet their bank, their entire bankroll on one bet and then keep hitting until they busted. So their first task was to figure out how to keep it from doing that, how to set a value so that how to set a cell probably over in this area that would change that from a hit to a stay most likely would be the best way to go about it. And uh, from there, there were other other kind of possibilities. And that leads me to talking about a little bit. So this communication that happened between the uh, controllers and the, the dealer had uh, several different message types that they could use. And the first one was an init, which had an initial, you know, was an initialization. And then it would send over, this is the player token I want. And the players in the reference implementation, it directly coordinated correlated to their team ID. However, it wasn't required to, it could have been any value. And then uh, the acknowledgement would come back from the dealer with a session cookie and the session cookie was used when they were hitting or staying. And then uh, they could set the bet amount and um, they could also, they would get a result when the hand was over. So after they stayed, 
or after they hit and they actually busted. And then if they, they could get different error codes. So there were several different ways that we thought that they would approach this. Uh, the main focus turned out to be trying to make the game play as well as possible. And, um, oh, one of the other, I'll back up another bit. So the reference implementation included this area called LifeLock, uh, which should have had three O's in it, I think. Um, oh, missed opportunity. Total missed opportunity. The Next LifeLock step. portion, so every team they shared, they got, a copy of the other team so they could see what they were doing, except for this redact this part here, which would be redacted. So here's an example. So uh, one of the teams very uh, came up with this, and it's similar to, to one of the approaches that I had when I was testing, moved everything out of the way and moved it up here so that it's in that looking back kind of at the same view, it's in this life lock area, so it's not getting copied. So when another team tried to copy it, this is what they got, which would have none of the instructions that they were actually executing or give them any idea of how to copy it. So they'd have to kind doesn't of- doesn't look like a very useful computer to me. Yeah, it I definitely- like most of the components of my computer to be connected. Definitely. No, man, it's the age of Wi-Fi. This is uh, the beginning of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth in the game of life. Hey, oh, I think you just invented Zardis's game of Wi-Fi life. Exactly. Of Wi -Fi life. <laughs> you shot little gliders over to a uh, signal. Yeah, the gliders don't work in uh, this rules implementation, though. You can't really do a glider because uh, the, the rule abstraction is different. Uh, if you could somehow implement the B3, S3, or whatever. But um, anyways, so based on some of... Like in most systems, when you've got uh, two or multiple systems that are communicating in some way and they trust that messages are going to meet, you know, certain uh, similarities, there are typically ways to exploit this. We didn't see a ton of the teams using this to exploit. Uh, the best teams were, you know, had a pretty good blackjack player. I think some of them had figured out some of the how to predict some of the shuffling and what the cards were going to be because they had gotten a little, um, uh, they'd gotten pretty good at playing the actual blackjack game. But for example, one of our expectations was that they would figure out that this player token could be whatever they wanted and that they knew what other teams tokens were. And so they could initialize as another team and basically do what's called spoof and, and spoof that player token of another team or another player and uh, then maximize the bet amount or um, the number of players that were available, there were only 16 seats at a table. So they could send across an init message that would, um, that would cause it to keep, uh, keep going. I'm sorry, they would send over a message that, that would fill up basically all of the player seats before any of the other players got there. I wrote a test for this, uh, and was able to, before like kind of a normal controller would send a message, I could fill up say four or five seats. So, but you would take it away. What? Can you uh, talk a little bit about like the custom hardware in Game of Life you had to create to do that? Uh, so I have one implementation where I don't have it here that um, where I did, uh, I did create basically, Looking down here, I created hardware for that. Let's see how I can do this I without. I'm worried. I have no idea what. Yeah, let's not let's not risk. Uh, yeah, and plus, we gotta we gotta wrap up in five minutes. We have to go back yeah. to the game. I think uh, at a high level, right, Eric? So you had um, these sort of network um, protocol vulnerabilities that would require understanding. Uh, how the um, game of life implementation and the emulation above that actually work together. Uh, and then you had a number of um, very interesting um, other kind of exploitation steps. Uh, yeah. We came up with nine or 10 steps in total that we expected the, the um, CTFers to uh, play this cat and mouse uh, yeah. game against. Yeah, there was like this, uh, 
cool CRC recheck, re reset that they could do. So the test for this, I'd filled in this region here. And when it counted up this entire region, it caused it to flip the bit value, uh, the 16 bit number back to zero. And when it reached zero, it would send a signal to the, to the dealer saying that you need to reload this yeah. player. So this was a way that they could set this value to go off at some time and then upload a new controller and have a mid game change say they could so that they could say offload or figure out something locally on their machine make some changes and upload it all within the scan of it you know automated within within a tick and this would uh fire for them one of the custom hardware that he's talking about i've got it slightly disconnected here but uh, we can see over here these values this is before you know it's on zero so as soon as it started they would it would start doing this and it's going to load up here and start at the net out within the first like 700 generations instead of like 10,000, which is kind of where most people start. And that's the, the key to uh, send out these initialization packets quickly. Um, yeah. So it's like looking at the matrix. I was just being yeah. hypnotized looking at those. Yeah, the same. So these are delay switches here, or these are uh, wire delays that slow it down so that it would have enough time for the other network packet to get picked up before this one shot in right over it but it was the attempt was to make it as you know short as possible and so you end up with um the situation where you've got different uh or the sorry i lost my train of thought again i can't not i don't know how you do that adam type and talk at the same time when you're when you're doing this like stuff. walking and talking oh i've yeah, loaded an AI into either, my though. brain it's exactly. just, I don't even know what I'm saying at this point. It just comes out. It's a massive sleep <laughs> deprivation. I expected yeah. that from Jan more than you. Cool. So, well, hey, since we're, I think we're at a good point here. Yep. Uh, yeah, it's great. Thank you, Tricky, for your awesome overview of the cas uh, casino. I think life one, life. one thing to mention about it is uh, there's a bit of a risk with these. Inception uh, in the stream. Oh. Yeah. There's a bit of a, a risk with these uh, King of the Hill um, challenges. In uh, Pinball, it worked out more or less as intended. In fact, the teams went beyond uh, the optimal solution. Casino Life was around for even longer. And I think out of our nine steps of uh, exploitation, the teams reached roughly step two. Uh, two and, two and, and like nine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they, they kind of uh, stumbled onto two different ones that but they there was a lot more that could have been done there um it's a bummer they didn't uh do it but we'll push that to archive as soon as we archive that oo as soon as we uh, get that working already on archive that are two predecessor challenges also written in game of life one uh, reversing and one uh, an exploitation challenge in the latter one we implemented a video game console in game of life and a team actually created a hardware mod chip in game of life to uh, win that game. Very cool. And Jan, I'm closing us out with uh, a, you know, we have visualization running for Ropship AI. This is the challenge that is currently going. So the teams, you know, we're not gonna go in depth about it and talk about it because it's currently ongoing, but we encourage you uh, watch the really cool stuff that's happening in here. People in the chat in CTF discussion text are talking about the cool strategies that people are doing. I mean, it's the level of control that the teams have over their uh, Rop ships is, really impressive. You can see people uh, putting on their shields at the right time, shooting people, um, getting out of the way of other shots. I mean, it's really super cool. So it's at coreboard.com AI. Ropship AI um, was, uh, the original Ropship was a challenge that we uh, created last year in which players had to do return-oriented programming to control their uh, avatars in the game. Um, Ropship AI, I think we can say is an exercise in constrained Difference. artificial Difference. intelligence, Difference. extremely constrained artificial intelligence. Um, so what they're able to accomplish with this is uh, very, very impressive. Well, cool. and we will take our constrained human intelligence and get back to trying to run this game. I uh, hope you've enjoyed uh, our time together. Yeah. And yeah, we'll see you all at the closing ceremonies where we announce the winners. Have a good one. See yeah. ya. Bye, everyone.